Good afternoon, everyone. So we've all heard this saying that time is money, but it's really not that simple. The idea is that you can convert time, which is really the only thing you have anyway, into money. But it doesn't always work the other way around. Sometimes your time or the time of someone you love can be robbed away from you. And even though you'd gladly exchange any amount of money to get that time back, money alone usually can't fix these kinds of problems. So given that time is your most precious, your most finite, valuable resource, what's the one thing you could do to protect your time or to get more of it? Well, obviously, we should be preparing for the zombie apocalypse. So, zombie briefing, part one. You've got to get your survival kit, your vehicle, your underground bunker, munitions, rations, plenty of potable water. This is really a lot to think about. Okay, okay, so maybe I'm a doomsday prepper, but maybe there's a principle here that also applies. You see, I've personally found that the very best uses of my time would indeed well prepare me for a zombie apocalypse. The very best uses of my time make me stronger, faster, and harder to kill. Even so, there are some important trade-offs to be made with the limited time that I have. Everything that might make me stronger may not necessarily make me faster. Everything that makes me faster may or may not make me harder to kill. In scientific terms, we could call this a multi-objective optimization problem. So looking back on my life, multi-objective optimization problems have really been a guiding influence and I've come to think a good paradigm for life in general. I was raised up in rural West Virginia by my great-grandparents. Now, we were poor and there was little chance of that changing, but whereas we were poor in money, we were not poor in values. I understand why that generation is called the greatest generation. They overcame something far more severe than a zombie apocalypse, and I can assure you that 50 years later, as I was a kid growing up in the 1980s, surrounded by 80-year-olds, those values were still on display daily. Grit, determination, resilience, perseverance. Now, I didn't really think of it this way at the time, but I was absorbing those values. I was making them my own, and those values would lay the foundation of my own personal quest to become stronger, faster, and harder to kill. In 1994, when I was 13, something totally unexpected happened. My maternal grandfather, who I'd barely even interacted with up to this point in my life, came for a visit. Now that was unusual. He, he lived out of state. We had no interaction. But what made the visit even more unusual was that he bought me a brand new computer. So remember back then computers were quite expensive and pretty rare, even more so on the road where I grew up. Now this computer would be the most amazing gift. It would fundamentally change the course of my life. The operating system on this computer was Windows 311. That was only so interesting. And I was quickly seduced by the dark side, the DOS terminal. So this is where I would spend countless hours and I would become completely obsessed learning how to program. And this actually turned into a real source of tension in my life as I had to start thinking more seriously about trading off my time. I could continue doing what I had been doing, status quo, or I could increasingly spend time in this solitary activity that no one around me seemed to really care about or understand. Now, the timing here was pretty good because as I wandered further and further down this labyrinth of logic that was programming, I noticed that I started to think about the world a little bit differently, more systematically, more logically, the way I was programming. And I was right up against the biggest optimization problem of my life at this point figuring out how I would escape the cultural inertia around me. How would I get into a college after high school and get this paid for? And what were all the things I would have to do to try to make that happen, to create some space for myself to, to go on and, and be somebody in the world? Well, on June 30th, 1999, just a couple of weeks after graduating high school, 
I showed up to Colorado Springs at the Air Force Academy for what would be the hardest four years of my life up to that point, and a multi-objective optimization problem unto itself, I, I can assure you, but the values of the greatest generation combined with this systematic thinking and this relentless desire to manage my time, it began to pay off handsomely. I would graduate at the top of my major in computer science, and right after being commissioned as a new second lieutenant, I would go right into grad school. And you'll never guess what I studied. Multi-objective optimization problems. <laughs> so I'll spare you all of those computer science lecture notes. I'll spare you all of the fine print of the master's thesis, and I'm just going to tell you the most important thing that I learned in grad school, which was this. If you're really serious about solving multi-objective optimization problems, the very best way to do it is with software that can learn from its own experience. The very best way to do it is with artificial intelligence. You see, even with the most powerful computers, we can't try all of the possible combinations fast enough to ever find the breakthroughs that we're looking for, and nor can we just sort of wander through the space intelligently guessing. We, we just can't intelligently guess through that space fast enough. Just after grad school, I was a newlywed. I'd just recently married my wife, and during this time, we were still getting to know one another, and we, well, she noticed she had some vision problems that were kind of coming out of nowhere. Uh, we went and we got this checked out, and we, uh, we received the most devastating news. She had, a, a, she had a cyst growing in her brain, and it had to be surgically removed as soon as possible. Now, the good news is that most of the cyst was removed. The bad news is the vision problems just got worse. The bad news is she contracted meningitis. It was misdiagnosed. It was mistreated with extended and high levels of steroids, which just wrecked every glandular function in her body, just completely wrecked her. And to this day, we are working through what I think of in my own mind as a big multi-objective optimization problem, trying to find a way to restore her health. So I asked you earlier, what's the one thing you could do to protect your time or to get more of it? More time for you and your family, more time for me and my family, more time for all of us. Well, for me, I've increasingly believe that the very best use of my time is to work on what I think is maybe the most meaningful and perhaps even the most complex multi-objective optimization problem of them all. Healthcare. Healthcare is insanely complex. I mean, it literally encompasses every human being on the planet. Decisions mean the difference between life, death, or lifetimes of wellness or chronic suffering. This just cuts right at the core of our humanity. And in healthcare, everything is at scale. I'm not aware of any small problems in healthcare. Here's what I've become completely convinced of. You can look at healthcare and the pockets within it as multi-objective optimization problems. And it's very convenient to do so because you can start to quantify it in ways that machine learning and artificial intelligence can help us to solve the big problems, to get the leverage that we need to increasingly make those breakthroughs in the space. Now, I'll be honest, I have a pretty conservative view of what I think is possible with artificial intelligence, but even so, I think it's the most disruptive thing I'll see in my life. And as I think about it, I think back to computers, and then we network those computers together with the internet, we shrink down the form factor, which makes them easier to distribute and get to the seven billion or so people in the world. Social networks and apps grow up and we begin to collect data about every last part of our lives. Now that actually sounds like the perfect setup for software that can learn from all of that data, software that can improve all aspects of our lives, especially our health and our health care. I'd like to share just a few examples of where AI is already making a difference 
in healthcare, and the first is in the personalized genomic space. And I'll sort of frame this within the broader quantified self context. Sequencing the genome is a big deal, and that's amazing. We've done that work. Now it's time to get busy understanding the genome. Understanding, well, what are all of those genes, and what do all of those genes really do, and how do they interact with one another and express themselves based on whether or not other genes are or aren't present? I mean, that's, that's actually beginning to sound like, oh, I, I don't know, a multi-objective optimization problem, perhaps. That's starting to sound like exactly the kind of situation where we can use artificial intelligence to get the leverage we need to make the breakthroughs happen even more so. And I'll give you an example of this. Some of you may already know you could leave here today, you could buy a kit for a little over $100, you spit in a tube, you mail it in, and a couple of weeks later, you get back this amazing collection of continually updating digital reports. These reports tell you everything from your uh, likely tolerance to caffeine or lactose, food allergens, which can make a big difference on your health and wellness, all the way to whether or not you're carrying certain recessive traits whether or not these traits may be important to know about as you have children of your own or as you continue to age. I've been a quantified self junkie and been into this stuff for years, keeping detailed nutrition logs and workout journals, and, and this stuff is helping me to take my own health and wellness to a whole new level. And I'm convinced as you look into it and start to apply it to your own lives, it's gonna make you stronger, faster, and harder to kill as well. Now, the Next thing I'd like to make sure is on your radar is machines that can read. Machines that process human communication, that's really nothing new. We've been doing that since the beginning. The old computer my grandfather bought me could do that just fine, thank you. But what's different now is machines that can actually understand that human communication to drive faster and better decisions. Now this is something very different. This is a very big deal. If you've ever studied language, it's a hard thing to wrap your head around. You have all of these words that mean something, and the context of those words changes depending on what other words are around them and you know, when they were said and what information has or hasn't superseded them and what you might already know. And I think you already see where this is going. This, this is starting to sound familiar, isn't it? This is starting to look like one of those multi-objective optimization problems. And I can assure you, Machine learning is advancing the state of the art here almost daily. This is where I've spent most of my own professional career. This is the wave of the future, machines that are understanding language. Let me give you an example in healthcare of where this is already making a difference. For a couple of years, we've been working with one of the large provider systems here in town, and we've built a system that reads pathology reports. We're using machines to determine if a patient has cancer, and if so, which kind of cancer they have. Now, to be clear, we're not interested in automating away MDs, physicians, nurses, those types of care providers at all. What we are doing here is we are providing a machine that can read to intelligently triage the information that is administrative. It's the overhead. What this ultimately allows the physician to do is to spend more time empathizing, delivering that human touch that makes such a difference when you may have just received the absolute worst news of your life. And this is a win for everyone. It's, it's a win for the provider. It's definitely a win for the patient. It's, it's a win for the whole healthcare system. It's making the whole thing stronger, faster, and harder to kill. A final example is stem cell therapy. And this is a particular interest to me because of all the chronic conditions that my wife and I have been through over the years. Now, much like in the example I told you about with genomics, understanding the complex interactions between stem cells and damaged tissues in the bodies, understanding whether or not an individual is a good candidate for a particular expensive experimental, experimental stem cell therapy based upon the chemical signatures in their body and, and what else is going on in their health. That's, that's sounding familiar, I hope. I hope you're already thinking. I hope you beat me to it. That is a multi-objective optimization problem unto itself. And just like in genomics, I mean, it's no surprise that our bioinformatics community has been using machine learning for a number of years, but the advancements 
in the broader space, the increasing speed of hardware, the increasing commoditization of the open source tools, well, it's, it's benefiting them, and they are able to move even faster to deliver these new stem cell therapies to all of us who need them. And I'm, I'm really happy to say my wife, she was determined to be a good candidate for one such therapy. Just last month, we flew out to Arizona so she could receive that therapy. Now, it's too early to know if this is the miracle we've been looking for in our own big multi-objective optimization problem that we're trying to solve, but I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that it's going to make her and others like her stronger, faster, and harder to kill than ever before. So whether it's advancing the art of what's possible in medicine, whether it's preparing for the zombie apocalypse, whether it's just a fresh perspective for life. I hope you see that the paradigm of a multi-objective optimization problem is a useful one because of the way it helps you to frame problems, because of the way you can quantify them and then begin to apply intelligent machines and artificial intelligence to get the leverage that leads to breakthroughs so that you, me, and all of us can become stronger, faster, and harder to kill. Thank you.